Kless. Welcome to the final segment in Lecture 18. And in this final segment, we're going to talk a little bit about Shapiro-Kaiser cyclones, which are a special type of extratropical or mid-latitude cyclone that we can have in the atmosphere. So with that, we will get right into it. Uh, one thing that we should note right away about Shapiro-Kaiser cyclones is these typically do not form over land. They usually form over water. They typically form in a marine environment where there is uh, relatively warm and moist water present uh, in the vicinity of the cyclone. And in the case of a Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone, there's a mechanism that actually weakens the northern fringe of the cold front. So you may remember back to the model where we had the cold front uh, circling around the center of the low. Uh, the northern edge of that cold front, that is the edge that's closest to the cyclone, is actually weakened by this mechanism that's referred to as differential rotation. And this is sort of, this basically carries some of the warmer air near the uh, near the warm front actually wraps itself around the center of the cyclone to form what's referred to as a bent back front and this also is what typically weakens the northern fringe of the cold front and this also results in what's really interesting about this is this also results in some much stronger descending motions as the cold air is surging around the cyclone so in the remember, remember in the when we looked at the horizontal anatomy in segment two, we talked about the uh, conveyor of cold air that descends down your ground level. In a typical cyclone, that descent is very gradual. Uh, that's also one of the reasons why you can get really strong winds behind a cold front because of that descending air bringing uh, faster mid-level winds down toward the surface or trying to bring the faster mid-level winds down to the surface. In the case of a Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone, that ascent is much, much more forceful, it is much, much sharper. So as opposed to as opposed to the mid-level winds gradually descending down to the surface. In the case of a Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone, those mid-level winds descend to the surface very rapidly, and that tends to result in a current of very strong air, which is often referred to as a sting jet. And the reason why it's called a sting jet is because if you look at uh, some weather data, it, the, uh, the feature actually looks like the stinger of, say, a hornet or a wasp. And this kind of gets its nomenclature from the same idea as a hook echo. There really is no hook part of the storm. It's just when we look at it on radar, there's a feature that looks like a hook, so we just call that a hook echo. And the way the sting jet got its name is the same idea. When you look at a particular data plot, it actually the feature actually looks like the stinger uh, or the abdomen of a hornet or a wasp. So that's where the term sting jet comes into play. And also the fact that the winds inside the sting jet can be quite insane. Uh, on a typical cold front, you're typically going to have at the strongest 20 to 30 mile per hour winds, maybe with some gusts higher than that. Cold winds behind cold fronts don't typically get much stronger than that, but the winds inside a sting jet uh, often exceed 40, 50, uh, even 60 miles per hour. In fact, in some extreme cases, uh, the winds can exceed hurricane strength. I even re I think there was a a case of a Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone going up towards Scotland, and there were some weather stations in Scotland that recorded 80, 90, even 100 mile per hour winds. I can't remember when exactly that was, but the winds inside the sting jet, inside the Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone, can be quite intense. And of course, because of these intense winds and the, the unusually intense winds in the Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone, these can pose a major threat to people on boats, especially uh, cruise liners and, uh, and especially smaller boats. Smaller boats are a lot easier to capsize in strong winds, but even cruise liners because these intense winds can uh, generate some pretty intense waves. If you've ever... If you ever talk to, a, say, a boating captain who's been inside of a hurricane where the winds are really intense, they'll talk about some of the wave heights that you can get. You can get 10, 20-foot waves, which can really rock a boat. But of course, you don't want tourists in an intense windstorm that you might get from a sting jet. But also, these can, of course, pose a significant threat to life and property if they come over land, because, again, you can have this really strong current of winds. Uh, potentially destroying houses and knocking down trees and power lines, which is obviously something that you don't want people to be around. You want people to be sheltered from that. So also compared to typical mid-latitude uh, mid latitude extratropical cyclones, these are rare in comparison. So these don't form very often, but when they do form, they, make their, they really make their presence known uh, if they, in fact, are impacting something. So uh, mariners definitely are concerned about this, but people in coastal regions also can be concerned by this if the Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone does, in fact, move closer to some landmass. So we'll actually take a look at the uh, structure of the cyclone, uh, of the Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone, and this uh, cold front, you may notice, is kind of detached from the low. So if you compare this to the extratropical cyclone, you'll see that this cold front is kind of detached from the low. And this results in sort of a T-shaped uh, frontal structure as opposed to a nice 
uh, right angle between the warm front and the cold front. And again, as this uh, as the current of warm air wraps around the center of the cyclone, you get what's referred to as a bent back front. Normally, this is represented by uh, X's in a row connected by a dashed line. But here, I'll use the occluded front symbol because it is kind of an inclusion process. It's a current of uh, warmer air, in this case, overtaking a current of colder air, which is kind of unusual to see. And then as this warmer air wraps around the center of the cyclone, now you get an occlusion of sorts, but it's not the same occlusion that we got in the case of an extratropical cyclone. You see the cold front is even more detached from the center of the low now as this warmer air wraps around the center of the low. So you can sort of imagine an area of somewhat colder air. It's trying to overtake the warm front, but really this is now just warm air just all wrapping around the center of the cyclone. And then as this process continues on, as this enters a more mature phase, that's when we can start to get the sting jet, which is the really strong downward descending mid-level flow that you can get aloft. And this is where the winds inside the superior size or cyclone can really make their presence known. And again, the cold front becomes even more detached from the center of the low. So these are really atypical. These aren't the the uh, typical cyclones that you see in the mid-latitudes. And if you get one of these, uh, they can uh, be quite a thrill for you, if you uh, especially if you don't know what to expect. But the again, the winds inside these cyclones can be really intense. Uh, other than a hurricane, they're probably the most intense cyclone that you can have in the mid-latitudes. But that's going to do it for this segment on cyclones. And we will sort of continue on this idea of fronts in the next lecture. So with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.